Welcome to Fast Talk, the water edition. Today we're joined by Ron Clowitter from SRP. Hi, Ron. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Ron, what do you do at SRP? I'm a uh, long-term planner for water supplies at SRP, and, and my projects all focus on preparing for uh, climate change on our watersheds and making sure that we have reliable water supplies for the next century. Wow. Um, so that's that's a couple of interesting points right there. So I just read some articles from, um, there was one on CNN talking about our water supply. So let's get back to that in just a minute. But first, uh, what does my electric company have to do with water? You know, that's, that's one of the first questions a lot of people ask. Um, and it's interesting because SRP was formed over 100 years ago, really as a water organization. Um, SRP was formed in order to manage uh, the water and power supplies of the Federal Salt River Project, uh, which is originally created by Roosevelt Dam up on the Salt River. And over time, you know, this was the early 1900s, um, we realized that in addition to water being really important, uh, power is very important to living in the desert. And so SRP started as a water organization with close ties to power, and over time we've grown where uh, now the primary customers that know SRP are power customers. And so we're both a water and power provider, um, but we primarily provide the water to uh, cities now, and the cities treat the water and then deliver it to the end users in their homes and businesses. So that's, that's quite a lot. Um, you mentioned the Roosevelt Dam. Um, so Roosevelt Lake is actually a water reservoir for um, the valley. That's right. Roosevelt and uh, six other reservoirs in central and northern Arizona capture the runoff from the Salt and Verde rivers, and we uh, store it in reservoirs and then deliver it here in the valley to make reliable supplies. So it sounds like most of the lakes that we're used to around the valley are actually part of our water supply? Absolutely. That's their primary function. You know, we all love to boat and picnic and recreate along these lakes. But the reason they're there is to make sure that we have reliable water supplies year after year here down in the Valley of the Sun. So do we get our drinking water from the Colorado River at all? Absolutely. So uh, the original supplies that were available to central Arizona were from the Salt and Verde Rivers because they naturally flow through the Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, Colorado River supplies are also imported here through the Central Arizona Project Canal. Um, and so today, the full metropolitan area gets their supplies um, from a mix, both Salt and Verde River water, as well as the Colorado River, which is really important um, from a reliability standpoint. You want to have a diverse portfolio of water supplies. So when there's drought and shortages on one system, you're able to pull more from another system. Um, and that's how we've grown and uh, how we can rely on our supplies here in the valley. So I mentioned some of those articles. and. Um, coming from other areas and looking in and you say, wow, there's a mega drought going on and all of the West is going to be out of water. Is that, is that an accurate portrayal of what's going on? You know, it's, it's always a bit more nuanced than what the top headline would say. Um, I would say top line, no, but it's complicated. The important thing to understand is that Arizona has always been a desert. From day one, as we started planning for the water supplies to support the communities, it's been a desert. And so we've planned accordingly, and we have not only surface water reservoirs, like those on the Salt and, River, Salt and Verde rivers we talked about, but we also have groundwater supplies that we've actively managed since 1980 here in Arizona. And in central Arizona, we focus on making sure that our aquifers remain in safe yield. We've been storing water underground from the Colorado River for well over 20 years. We've stored millions of acre feet. An acre foot is about enough water to serve three families for an entire year. So we've been preparing for drought and shortage conditions for more than two decades. And the way that we do that is by using more surface water when it's available from our reservoirs and rivers. And then when there's shortages on, from those rivers, we're able to pull more from groundwater supplies. And we don't pull from our savings account, so to speak, our groundwater supplies haphazardly. We're very careful and we make sure that as we pull from those supplies that we're planning to either replace them um, or we've pre-stored that water for a time of shortage like we're talking about today. 
Well, I'm, I'm certainly glad we had that level of planning. And it sounds like it's been going on for a long time and perhaps not so much in other states, um, particularly those you mentioned, we've always been a desert. So water has always been scarce and we've had to, to, to manage it. Some of the other states, I would imagine, probably haven't had that situation. And maybe that's where some of those stories originate. Um, you mentioned the 1980s, and one thing I know about from that period was that um, before you build, say, a subdivision, you have to do some water reports. Is that accurate? Yeah, so um, starting in 1980 with what's called the Groundwater Management Act, Arizona started to focus really hard on how do we collectively plan our water supplies. Another thing that Arizona has done very well is think about the long-term game. We want strong economic development in our state. We want people to want to move here, to place their families, to place their businesses. But the way you do that is by planning in the long term. So what you're referring to is the Assured Water Supply Program that Arizona has had in place for decades. And what that requires is new development has to look out 100 years and show that you have both legally available water and physically available water to meet the demands of new development. And that's not intended to be a barrier to entry, but a guarantee that if you're gonna to come to this state, if you're gonna to come to central Arizona to place your business, you know, your development, um, that there will be enough water that those consumers don't have to worry that their taps won't turn on one day. So one of the uh, items that I think I read um, uh, from SRP was that as we expand the valley, what we're actually doing is removing uh, farmland. Um, and the farmland was actually more water intense than um, an individual house. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, generally speaking, that's right. Um, you know, when SRP was formed well over 100 years ago, it was formed to produce agriculture. So making sure we had the water supplies that could uh, support the farmland within SRP's water service area. Um, over the last hundred years, we've gone from about 100% agriculture to uh, less than 5% agriculture on those lands. And since 1980, if we look starting around 1980, the water use on SRP's service area lands has decreased by about 30%. Um, a big part of that is that ag to urban transition, but also, uh, urban uses have become incredibly more efficient. Uh, not only inside the house, think low use uh, water use toilets, um, appliances like washers, uh, clothing and dishwashers, uh, shower heads, but also outside the home, people have started to recognize more and more that the desert uh, landscape in your yard not only is very aesthetically pleasing, it's nice to look at, but it also creates great shade to hang out. So um, we've seen less and less outdoor use at homes and businesses. And so overall, we're becoming more and more efficient in the state in terms of water use. Um, and I heard Governor Ducey at a speech this week, um, since the 1950s, we're actually using less water today in the state than we were back in 1950. And just think about how much our population has grown since 1950. Yeah, that's incredible. So adding all of those millions of people and we were still using less water Absolutely. Uh, overall. That's, that's amazing. Um, and speaking of water, for all those millions of people, so you, you talked about the watershed briefly. Um, the watershed um, I've heard most often mentioned in relation to fire and fire scars. So how does that interrelate with our water? Yeah, so a watershed very simply is, is basically the, the land that drains into a river system. Um, so the Salt and Verde watersheds cover the area about from Red Mountain uh, going north uh, north and west and north and east up to the Grand Canyon in New Mexico. So it's about 14,000 square miles. Um, if you have been up along the Mogollon Rim, the White Mountains, Flagstaff, you know that there's a lot of pine trees in northern Arizona, ponderosa pine, and they um, naturally experience fires every summer. Um, fire is an important pruning, natural pruning mechanism to keep the fires from being uh, over, or the forest from being overgrown. And over the last hundred years, we have heavily suppressed fires as more uh, humans lived in Arizona, as more cattle were grazing. We wanted to prevent fires from damaging homes and harming people. 
Um, well, unintentionally, we've created an overgrown forest, which is now prone to catastrophic fire. And those catastrophic fires are those that are, we're used to seeing today, where the forests are closed down, the fire, you can see the plumes of smoke going miles into the atmosphere. And what that causes in terms of impacts to our water supplies is it removes the trees that help retain snowpack, which melts and drains into our rivers. Um, it creates pollution in terms of uh, contaminants into our water supplies, sediments into our water supplies. Those sediments can reduce reservoir capacity and inhibit our ability to store water. So there's a lot of complex challenges from our water supply perspective caused by these forest fires in, in addition to just the horrifying you know, impacts to the communities that are, are nearby these fires and the firefighters who may lose their lives trying to put these fires out to protect those communities. So when we have those big fires and those trees are now gone, um, you mentioned snowpack um, and, and rain, I suppose, um, then the soil is, is not able to stay in place and it ends up in our reservoirs? Absolutely. So um, the burn scars, the, the, the fires are so hot that they just, it almost looks like the moon after these fires happen. And then if you're, if you've lived in Arizona any amount of time, you know that these fires are starting in late May, early June when it's very hot and dry. And then what we all look forward to is the monsoon season starting mid-June, early July. And those fires end up being put out by those rains oftentimes. But those intense monsoons that we all love also sweep away the soils and the surface. And that can end up in our reservoirs, contaminating and reducing capacities. So is there one section of the of the reservoirs that's been more stressed um, in that regard than others? You know, we've seen the impacts of fire on, on both sides of the system. The big fires have been on the salt, but we are experiencing sediment issues on the Verde River system. And a big reason that that issue is so acute right now is because the Verde River reservoir system is about uh, a tenth of the size of the Salt River system. And so we've seen natural sedimentation, some of that from fires, um, other just from uh, the fact that rivers are mud bottom systems. And so that sediment ends up being swept in. And we've lost about a third of our capacity at Horseshoe Reservoir on the Verde River. Uh, horseshoe. What are some of the reservoirs on the Verde side of it? So we have two, uh, two reservoirs on the Verde. We have Bartlett Reservoir, which is the lower uh, reservoir and lake. Um, and then the upper is called Horseshoe Reservoir. Um, it's about half the size of Bartlett uh, today. So when you get the sediments in there um, and you're losing capacity, we need to get the capacity back, I would imagine. So we have drinking water. Um, how do we go about doing that? Yeah, you know, that capacity is so critical to catching those big rain and snow melt events. And so as we lose capacity, we have to be looking at how to restore it. Um, we've worked a lot at SRP with a lot of partners, including the Town of Queen Creek and the Bureau of Reclamation, at looking at options to restore that capacity lost. And one of the best opportunities we're looking at is raising Bartlett Dam. So we would be making modifications to the existing dam and reservoir at Bartlett to expand the capacity to restore what we've lost. But the great opportunity that we found through these studies is we could expand the overall size of Bartlett to create additional capacity to capture water. And that water could go to help communities like uh, Town of Queen Creek and others who need supplemental supplies to uh, replace shortage water from the Colorado or help reduce groundwater dependency. And so that's where we are today, really looking at how we could expand the system to help uh, spread the water supplies and provide them to those uh, communities that need them for growth and to support their long-term viability. So raising the dam um, is, is an option, and, and I think that happened with Roosevelt recently? Yeah, um, so we had some uh, similar issues in the, uh, in the late 80s and 90s that we were trying to resolve at Roosevelt. One of the biggest pieces was dam safety. Uh, Roosevelt Dam, as I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion, uh, was built around, starting around 1903. And uh, starting around the 70s, 80s, they started to realize that uh, that dam wasn't quite constructed with uh, enough capacity to release the large flood events we see. And so Roosevelt Dam was raised by about 75 feet in the mid-90s. 
um, not only to make sure it was a safe structure to protect the communities downstream, but it also added about 350,000 acre feet of capacity that six valley cities invested in and now are able to capture and store water and put to use within their service areas. And those supplies are very critical as backup supplies um, for times of shortage on the Colorado River um, and to help supplement any groundwater use that they need. As we talked, we, we protect our groundwater supplies as if they're our savings account. And so we want to make sure we have those supplemental and additional supplies to make sure that we can replenish um, or supplement groundwater supplies. So um, raising the dam's been done. Um, and you're looking at that for Bartlett. What about, um, like I know in a lot of the Gulf Coast communities, they, they tend to dredge channels. Is that um, something that can be done on a reservoir? Yeah, you know, dredging was one of the most obvious and sort of simple technologically um, concepts we looked at early on. Um, the challenge with dredging at Horseshoe is it's a very remote reservoir. If you've ever been there, um, you take about an hour drive up a nice paved windy road and then another hour drive up a very rough dirt road um, that even uh, off-road vehicles have challenges on. And by the end of it, you'll be wondering if you need to go to the dentist. <laughs> so as we're looking at bringing the heavy equipment up that would be necessary for dredging, it'd be a very large challenge. The second challenge is, what do you do with that sediment once it's removed? Um, all of our reservoirs are within federal lands um, that were designated to protect the reservoirs, but they're also great recreation locations and important um, environmental locations. So to dispose of 45,000 acre feet of sediment, uh, we're talking two square miles, 50 feet high. Oh. And so to remove that sediment is one thing, very challenging, very costly, but then to dispose of it is, a, is an entirely um, new challenge. And that's where we really uh, early on moved on from that idea, working with stakeholders, working with water managers that um, though it could solve the problem technically, economically, environmentally, it really didn't make sense. Uh, that's a lot of uh, sediment. <laughs> yes. um, so if, they, uh, if you uh, raise the height of the dam, uh, the lake gets bigger, um, is that going to be um, the case there. I, I'm not familiar with the terrain necessarily on horseshoes. So are we going to have more um, fishing, recreating opportunities, things like that, sort of like Roosevelt? Absolutely. So the new uh, reservoir at Bartlett would be about double the size surface area wise. And so lots more opportunity for boating, camping on the shorelines. One of the great things about this modification is the new reservoir would be completely contained between two existing dams. So when we're also thinking about environmental concerns like uh, protecting native fish and native bird species, uh, we'd be able to manage the system even better because we'd have the, the storage reservoir contained between two dams and be able to control the sport fishing, which is very popular at, Bar at Bartlett. Um, those sport fish uh, are fun to catch, but also really are fast and aggressive. And the native fish of Arizona aren't as used to those populations. So we want to keep those fish contained in the reservoir and out of the natural river channel above um, to be able to protect those native fish who tend to be a little bit slower um, and smaller um, and need them. It sounds like there's a lot of um, environmental concerns that you've brought up several times. So um, it looks like SRP is looking at those um, quite a bit. So when you're managing uh, natural resources like water supplies, um, environmental uh, management is always top of mind. And we've always worked at SRP very closely with the environmental community to make sure that our operations um, are as, as conducive with the environmental factors around as we can. And as we work to balance water management, we have to keep a lot of things in mind. I've mentioned all of them today. Public safety is the dam safe. Flood safety, can we manage floods so they're not washing out the dams downstream communities? Uh, water supply, of course, but also environmental and recreational factors. So we've been working with stakeholders from all of those different sectors to make sure that the plans that we end up identifying as best uh, can meet as many of those needs as possible, and at the very least that we are offsetting any negative impacts of the project. But we see a lot of opportunities for environmental benefits from what we've learned from the management of these reservoirs since construction. Uh, one of the big factors is that Horseshoe, there's a lot of great habitat that we may be able to manage even better 
um, for native fish and bird species. And we're working closely with environmental groups and stakeholders to look at different ways we can optimize uh, our operations to not only protect, but maybe even enhance the environment uh, for those different precious species. We have the reservoirs. Um, the reservoirs provide us with recreation, uh, environmental protection, and um, uh, drinking water for here in the valley. So with those stories, I know you've probably seen them too, what would be um, your take on, um, on those that were you know, running out of water and um, life is about to end in the desert? So first I would say we can never stop planning for our water supplies. But the nice thing is we've today in Arizona are standing on the shoulders of people who put a lot of thought into this from the very beginning and made very large infrastructure investments to make sure we have the supplies we need. So we're not in an emergency situation, but that doesn't mean that we can stop planning and working to ensure that we have the supplies we need. The Bartlett project we were just talking about is one of those that shows just how well Arizona works together to ensure that we have the supplies we need. We have 21 partners that are working with the Bureau of Reclamation to support the study to look at expanding Bartlett Dam. And it's a very uh, interdisciplinary team. We have uh, members of tribal communities, agricultural community, uh, as well as the municipal and industrial community. Um, almost every uh, city and town in the Phoenix metropolitan area is supporting this study financially and with expertise because we all need to work together to ensure that we have the water supplies we need, not only to support our existing communities, but also to grow as the communities continue to do so. Any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, anything else that we need to know? You know, I think one of the great things that the Queen Creek Chamber does is bring people together. And that's what we have to do to plan for our water supplies. And we've done that from the beginning in Arizona and we'll continue to do that in Arizona because if we don't work together, we'll fail together. And so organizations like the Queen Creek Chamber do exactly what we need by hosting these types of conversations, by bringing organizations together that care about these issues. And as I said before, we can't you know, rest on our laurels and just say, you know, mom, dad, grandpa, grandma did all the work for us and we're good. But as long as we're coming together to talk about these things, to plan together, to work through the tough decisions that have to be made, Arizona will have the water supplies that we need. I think that's great. Um, and we certainly appreciate um, all of the work that has gone before and the work that you're currently doing. Um, final um, uh, information, where can people get um, information if they have more questions. Is there a site? Absolutely. So um, you can go to uh, srpnet.com to find more about SRP's water system and our power system. Um, and if you go to that website, there's all sorts of different, uh, different tabs and videos and clips that you can learn about. Um, as well as srpnet.com slash sediment, you can learn more about the Bartlett Dam modification uh, work that we're doing. Um, a lot more information to come in the coming years as we work with the partners and with the Bureau of Reclamation to study this. Um, and ultimately, hopefully, we'll, we'll be constructing a new facility that will support the communities for another century to come. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Ron. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.